Now in 2 Timothy chapter number 4, we have the famous passage where Paul is speaking unto the young preacher, his protege in the ministry, Timothy. And this is the last of 10 chapters that he has written unto Timothy, and he's giving him advice for being a preacher. He's giving him advice for being a pastor. And in verse number 2, he says, Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry, for I am now ready to be offered in the time of my departure is hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And so in this passage we see that uh, Paul is, is warning Timothy that there's going to come a day when people will not want to hear sound doctrine and when they will turn away their ears from hearing the truth. And what he's expressing to Timothy is the importance that even when that time comes in Timothy's life or even when that time comes in a, in a nation or in a society, it is important that he continue to preach the word, whether it be in season or out of season, whether it's popular or not, whether it's what they want to hear or don't want to hear. He says, keep bringing the doctrine, keep bringing the reproofs. The reproof is to basically tell someone that they're wrong. Keep bringing what they need to hear, not necessarily what they want to hear. And what I want to talk about this morning is that there's a movement today away from this type of preaching and this type of church. You know, the church that you're sitting in right now, Faithful Word Baptist Church, is not the type of church that most Christians are sitting in this morning. It just simply isn't. The vast majority of Christians today are sitting in churches that would be classified as a new evangelical church or, a, or the mega church movement. What I like to call the fun center, the fun church. And, and, and basically, there's a movement today uh, uh, getting away from the old paths, getting away from old-fashioned preaching, getting away from an old-fashioned Bible-believing church, and it's this modern, uh, new church, newfangled, rock and roll, NIV, party, fun type of a church, and it's not a biblical church. And I'm going to explain to you what's wrong with that movement, because not only is the church that you're sitting in not that type of church, but Faithful Word Baptist Church does not even want to begin to resemble this type of movement in any way, shape, or form. You say, well, why don't you do things a little more like, you know, Cornerstone down in Chandler? Can't believe you just named the name. Because I've seen their billboards. They, they, they put up a sign that said, church for people who don't like church. Well, that's not me. I love church. I love the Bible. I love the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not looking for a church that's geared toward people who don't like church. And then they had another one up that said, religion, and I'm going to tone it down for you. Religion stinks. It said something worse than that, but I'm just going to give you, you know, my toned down version. It said, religion stinks. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't stink. Religion is a good thing, and I'm going to preach to you, biblically speaking, why that whole movement is misguided and why we are not changing and why we are not going to change with the times. We're not going to become a contemporary type church. We are going to stay a traditional, old-fashioned, Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church until doomsday. Now, if you would, go to Ephesians chapter 4. Let me show you the first thing that is philosophically wrong with that movement. And you say, well, Pastor Anderson, I'm not sure you really know what you're talking about about this movement. Well, let me tell you this. When I was 12 years old, the church that my parents and I went to went bad. There were some problems, and, and we ended up leaving that church. Well, we strove to find a good church, and my parents couldn't really find a, a good Bible-believing church, and so they finally just threw up their hands, and I'm not saying they should have done this, but this is just what they did. They threw up their hands and said, you know what, maybe we're wrong. You know, maybe we, we can't find any fundamentalist Baptist churches. Maybe we're just, you know, a little too strict, or maybe we're just a little bit too fundamental. I don't know. So they decided to start taking us to these type of churches that were more the, the, the new evangelical, modernistic type. And we actually went to churches like that from the time I was 12 to the time I was 16 years old. So I have a lot of experiences. I spent about five years going to the type of church that I'm talking about this morning. That's a, it's an NIV type church, a rock and roll church, uh, a church with no soul winning, a church with no hard preaching, a church where literally the word hell never came out of the pastor's mouth for the whole many years that we went there. 
And I asked my dad, I said, Dad, I said, I've been reading my Bible lately, and the Bible talks a lot about hell. Why has our pastor never even used the word hell once from the pulpit or even mentioned hell? It's like it doesn't exist. And he said, son, that's a great question. I'm going to ask him because you're right. He doesn't mention it. And he went and asked the pastor. He said, why do you never mention hell? Why do you never bring up the fact that hell is real and that hell exists? I've never even heard you say the word hell. And he said, you know what? I know I should, but I just don't like to. I just don't want to. It's just too negative. You know, that's the day that we're living in where pastors are getting up and deciding, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to preach that because I don't feel like it. Instead of just preaching the word, whether it's in season or out of season. Now, the first thing that is wrong with this movement, whatever you want to call it, some people call it the mega church movement. Some people call it the neo-evangelical movement. Some people call it contemporary churches or, or seeker-sensitive churches. Am I missing any terms? Brother, get, help me out if I'm missing any. Uh, you know, whatever you want to call this movement. And when I say the mega church movement, the size of these churches is not the problem. Because there's nothing wrong in the world with a church being big. And I fully expect our church to be big someday. I mean, our church grows every single year. Nothing in the world wrong with a big church. But it, when you're big at the expense of telling the truth, that's a problem. But let's look at the first thing that is wrong with that movement uh, biblically. Go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 10. Actually, let's start in verse 11. It says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. What is the purpose here? Why did God give us a pastor and a teacher? Why do we even come to church and listen to preaching? The Bible says in verse 12, For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. The first thing I want to point out that's wrong with this movement is that it is a church that is geared toward unsaved people as opposed to being geared toward saved people. Now here the Bible tells us that the reason why we have pastors and teachers is for the perfecting of the saints. Do you see that in verse number 12? It says it's for the edifying of the body of Christ. And you see, on paper, we all understand that a church is supposed to be an assembly of born-again baptized believers. And so if the church is an assembly of born-again baptized believers, and God said, hey, the purpose of pastors, the purpose of teachers is to perfect the body of Christ, to build them up, to edify them, to teach them so that they can learn the doctrines that they need to learn so that they will not be easily deceived, then why do we have a philosophy out there now that gears church toward the unsaved and they believe that a church service is supposed to be geared toward unsaved people that they will feel comfortable that they will enjoy it that it will be what they want to find in a church and that is what's wrong and they say well you know we want to reach as many people as possible and we want to bring in as many unsaved people into our church as we possibly can that we might win them to Christ but that is not what the Bible teaches it sounds great. I mean, I, I have to admit, sounds great. And I was sucked into it for a long time in my teenage years. Yeah, we got to make church uh, geared toward the lost and geared toward the unsaved. But wait a minute, the Bible tells us to go out and win the lost. See, the Bible says, go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The Bible says, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. And the Bible, when it talks about preaching the gospel in regard to the whole armor of God, he, he uses the feet to represent preaching the gospel. The Bible says having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. He said, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings and good things. Why? Because your feet denote that you're going somewhere. He could have used the mouth, could have used the hands, but he used the feet because in order to get people saved, you must go out and get them saved, not try to bring them in and invite them in to come in and get saved. And you say, well, 
if you would just tone down your preaching a little bit, if you would just mellow out the preaching, if you would just make the music a little bit more like the rock and roll music, you know, make the music a little bit more like the current hip hop music, then when unsaved uh, people walk in, they'll feel more comfortable because it'll feel more like the music that they're used to. It'll feel more like uh, the, the kind of motivational speaking that they're used to, not this kind of hard edged biblical preaching. And they think, you know what, then you'll reach more people. But you know how you'll really reach more people is by just going out and telling people about the gospel. Like Jesus actually told us to do, you know, going out two by two. And you'll notice that when Jesus preached, when he stood up and preached his great sermons like the Sermon on the Mount or the Olivet Discourse, when Jesus preached those sermons, they were, they were not geared toward the unsaved. It's always geared toward the saved. Why is that? Because he sent out his disciples two by two. They went out and preached the gospel. They went out and won people to Christ. They went out and baptized the converts. And then they brought the people in already saved. And then Jesus could teach them how to live their lives. Jesus could teach them about end times Bible prophecy or whatever it was that he was preaching in that particular sermon. But we've been misguided when we want to gear church toward the unsaved. We should first and foremost gear church toward what is, how does God want it to be? What kind of preaching is God looking for? What kind of singing is God looking for? And then secondly, we should gear it toward, you know, what's going to build up God's people the most? What's going to edify them the most? What do they need to hear the most? Now, let me ask you this. Is the plan of salvation what saved people need to hear the most on Sunday morning? Who in here, let me just ask you, who in here believes on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? You're saved and you know you're going to heaven. Okay, look around, everybody. Now, tell me why, again, I'm supposed to preach on the plan of salvation this morning. Look at all the hands. And yet today, even in independent fundamental Baptist churches now, you show up on Sunday morning and nine times out of ten, the sermon is on the plan of salvation. The sermon is on getting saved. The sermon is on, look, you're, you're not feeding the people when you do that. And people have criticized me. They said, I came to church on Sunday morning and I didn't hear you preach the gospel at all. Or, you know, I didn't even hear you cover the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is because my goal is to preach the entire Bible, not to keep telling the plan of salvation to people who've already been saved for years. Because I'm not gearing my sermon toward an unsaved person. I'm gearing my sermon toward a saved person. You see, there are lots of people here this morning. The whole room is filled with people who are already saved, but they need to learn doctrine. They need to learn the rest of the Bible. They need to learn how to live their lives. They need to learn how to run their marriage. They need to learn how to raise their kids. They need to learn how to uh, do well on the job. They need to learn to read their Bibles and pray. And they need to learn to go soul winning and how to witness to people and, and preach the gospel to every creature. They need to learn all the commandments of God so that they can love Him and keep His commandments. They don't need to just hear the plan of salvation over and over and over again. And you say, well, I just like to hear it. Okay, well then come out soul winning with me. Let's not some doors and you can hear it all day long. You can hear the plan of salvation 10 times. Just show up for soul winning today and you'll hear the plan of salvation all day long. But in church, we need to gear it toward the saved. What is the music for the saved? What is the preaching for the saved? That's what we ought to do because the Bible teaches that the church is for the saved, not the unsaved. Now, do unsaved people sometimes come to church? Absolutely. And the Bible talks about in 1 Corinthians 14, if one that believeth not entereth in. And he acts like it's the exception. He acts like it's the anomaly because most of the people there are going to be saved. And they say, well, you need to tone things down because the most important thing is getting people saved and, and, and we need to bring in more people. But we don't have to bring in people to get them saved. That's what we need to get out of our mind. We don't need to bring people to church to get them saved. We can go out and get them saved. And you say, well, but I just want you to do it for me. Well, that's, that's great, but I'll get all the rewards in heaven. I want you to go out and get people saved. You get the rewards, okay? But n number two, go to 2 Timothy 4 where we were. So first of all, the problem philosophically and biblically with that movement is that it gears church toward the unsaved instead of the saved. There is nothing in the Bible that teaches that church is an evangelistic tool. You know, that, that, that church is meant so that, okay, here's how we're going to get people saved. We're going to bring everybody to church and then preach them down the aisle. That is not a biblical concept. That's not the way they did it in the Bible. You notice that the apostles in the New Testament, they were always going out on Saturdays 
and they'd go to the synagogues and preach to the unsaved Jews in the synagogues. Paul went down to the river where all the women were washing their clothes and doing the laundry. And he figured, oh, they're probably bored, you know, in the laundromat. And so he went down there and he preached them the gospel while they did the laundry. You know, he was always going out. And then when you notice when Sunday rolled around, they're breaking bread with the believers. They're breaking bread with the apostles. You know, they're breaking bread with the disciples of Christ. They're not uh, having an evangelistic service. But if you would, look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. We'll see the next thing that's wrong with this movement. It says in verse uh, 2, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Now that says right there, all doctrine. Does it not? Because when it says all long suffering and doctrine, the all is referring to both the long suffering and the doctrine. He's saying preach all doctrine. But yet today, this mega church neo evangelical movement downplays doctrine. And says, oh man, you know, we need, to, we need to not worry so much about doctrine and let's just focus on the heart. You know, let's just focus on Christ. Let's just focus on the gospel. You know, let's not worry about all this doctrine. But yet the Bible 51 times mentions doctrine by that exact word. And here he says, preach all doctrine. Let me ask you this. Is there any doctrine that's found in the Bible that I should not be preaching? No, no because he's telling a young preacher, preach all doctrine. Okay, and I'm supposed to preach the whole book cover to cover, all doctrine. Go back just, uh, just one page there to 2 Timothy 3 at the end. It says in verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, throughly furnished unto all good works. Now, when the Bible uses the word perfect, it means complete or entire. It does not mean sinless. No one is sinless. But it means that he is complete, or entire. It means he's not lacking anything or leaving anything out. Now, stop and think about this verse for a minute. He says, all scripture is profitable for doctrine. And he says that the purpose of it in verse 17 is that the man of God may be perfect, throughly furnished unto all good works. Isn't that saying that if I'm lacking a part of the scripture, or if I'm not preaching a part of the scripture, I'm not perfect, I'm missing something? I'm not really throughly furnished unto all good works. I don't have, what does furnished mean? You know, it could mean basically outfitted would be the word I would use, or equipped. You know, you get furnished for a certain uh, uh, maybe hiking trip, or, or maybe you're going to battle and you, you put on the, the gear. He's saying, throughly furnished unto all good works. We need to preach every doctrine in the Bible. And many people will say about a fundamental Baptist church, you know, you guys want to major on the minors. Have you ever heard that statement before? You want to major on the minors. You're making too much of a big deal about little things. But you know what? I want to make a big deal about everything. I don't think there are any little things in here. I think anything that God said or that Jesus said, you know, is important. It is doctrine that needs to be preached. And Jesus said, whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments. Did you hear that? and shall teach men so, the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. According to the Bible, if I find the least commandment and teach it and preach it and live it, then I will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. That shows how God feels about the so-called minors, majoring on the minors. He says uh, just a few verses earlier in 2 Timothy 3.10, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. Isn't it great that Paul was able to say to Timothy, you've fully known my doctrine. Not, well, you knew a lot of my doctrine, but there was a lot of my doctrine that I couldn't really preach because it would have offended people. He said, no, you fully knew my doctrine. Why? Because I preached all of it. Because I preached all doctrine. Because I preached all scripture. And that is what we should strive for as preachers. Uh, go back, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Just a few pages to the left in your Bible. And here's what's interesting. The word doctrine is used 51 times in the Bible. But one third of those mentions, one out of three of those mentions, 16 mentions are in 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus. Just these three short books. Why? Because they're, they're books that are written toward preachers. And so the so-called pastoral epistles, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, contain one-third of the references to doctrine of all the mentions of that word in the entire Bible. 1st Timothy 4.16, it says this, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Is he saying, hey, don't worry about doctrine. Don't split hairs over doctrine. 
Don't separate over doctrine. No, he says, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Look at 1 Timothy 5.17. And when the Bible uses the word elder, it's referring to a pastor. It uses the word elder, bishop, and pastor interchangeably. It says in 1 Timothy 5, 17, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. So what is the most honorable thing for a pastor to be laboring in? Doctrine. So any movement that downplays doctrine, anytime you hear the word doctrine coming out of someone's mouth in a negative way, say, oh man, all this doctrine, oh, you talk so much about your doctrine, oh, uh, doctrinal, you know what? That person is in violation of what the Bible is saying. I mean, they're contrary, their philosophy is totally contrary to God's word. So not only does it gear church toward the unsaved, go to James uh, chapter 1. Not only is it geared toward the unsaved, not only is it downplaying of biblical doctrine, and by the way, those two things go hand in hand. Because if you're gearing church toward the unsaved, you don't want to teach all doctrine. You just want to keep talking about how Jesus died on the cross and Jesus loved everybody and died for everybody and was buried and rose again. That's all you're going to talk about because you're gearing it toward the unsaved. And look, by the way, that's all the unsaved need to hear. I mean, when I go out knocking doors and I go out soul winning, I don't show up at their doorstep and start preaching to them all the doctrines of the Bible, right? I don't show up and start giving them a dissertation on, you know, all the commandments of the Old Testament. I don't knock on their door and give them a dissertation about the book of Leviticus. You know, I don't show up and knock on their door and start talking to them about how they should be clothed and how they should be dressed. I don't show up and knock on their door and start talking to them about the importance of reading your Bible every day and praying. I don't talk about any of those things because as Paul said, when he showed up among the Corinthians, he said, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. You see, people that are unsaved, all they need to hear is the gospel. They need to hear the plan of salvation. They need to hear that they're a sinner. They need to hear how Jesus Christ died on the cross for all their sins, was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. They need to hear about heaven. They need to hear about hell. They need to hear about the eternal life and eternal security of the believer. But let me tell you something. At church, we need to preach all doctrine and not just that plan of salvation message. And so when you have a church geared toward the unsaved, you're going to stop talking about doctrine and every sermon is going to be about Jesus and about his love and about him dying on the cross. I love those subjects, but I'm not going to preach on them every day. Look, have you ever heard of too much of a good thing? I don't think it's bad. I don't think, who thinks bananas are bad for you? I think bananas are really good for you. I love bananas, okay? And if, I, if you were to walk in here with a banana in your hand and eat a banana... I would not say to you, you know what, you're doing an unhealthy thing by eating that banana. Because a banana is a very healthy thing to eat. But if you told me, Pastor Anderson, for the last year, I've eaten nothing but bananas. I mean, I'm just, that's all I eat. For breakfast, I have bananas, lunch, bananas, dinner, bananas. Because I would tell you, you know what, that's dangerous. That's unhealthy. In fact, I'm surprised you're even still alive after one year on nothing but bananas. And if you continue this, you will die. That doesn't mean I'm, I'm down on bananas. You know, we had a guy, I mean, this is kind of weird, but we had a guy who showed up at our house because we, we, we do uh, raw milk. And so we get it from a dairy in town. And uh, this guy showed up and he's picking up raw milk and he's telling my wife how he just drinks nothing but raw milk now. He does not eat food. He does not cook any food. He just drinks or eats nothing except raw milk. Now look, raw milk's very good for you. But if you're a grown adult man and you're just living off of raw milk, you know, you're going to die. That's not going to work. That's not healthy. And he'd only been on it. He'd only been doing it for a few weeks, you know, and, and we're thinking to ourselves, well, yeah, you feel great. You're only a couple weeks into this. In a couple months, you're going to die. And, and so not that I'm down on raw milk, not that I'm down on bananas. And, and see, that's what it is. I mean, when you have this preaching on the plan of salvation, preaching on the love of Jesus and preaching on, uh, you know, the death, burial, and resurrection. Those are very nutritious things for you to be hearing. Those are very good sermons. But if that's all you're getting, you are severely lacking nutrients that you must have in order to be a healthy Christian, in order to be a well-balanced, well-nourished uh, Christian. Go to James uh, 1, 26. It says, If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, 
to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. And so here we see a positive reference to religion. And what is religion defined as? Well, two things. Number one, he says religion is visiting the fatherless and widows in their affliction. And secondly, he said, religion is keeping yourself unspotted from the world. Now, this movement today always has something negative to say about religion. And look, I know I was there for five years, and I even, I even said this before. You know, because you hear it so much. I even said, oh, I don't have a rela religion. You know, I have a relationship. Yep. You know, I've said that to people when I was a teenager. And I'm embarrassed to say it, but I, I said that. I've used that. But why? Because you hear it so many times, this negativity toward religion. And they say, oh, Christianity's not a religion. It's not a bunch of do's and don'ts. It's just a relationship. But yet the word relationship's never found in the Bible, and the word religion is. Now, why would, why would this mega church, new evangelical movement downplay religion? Why? Because they don't want to keep themselves unspotted from the world. That's why. That's, it. that's why. Because they don't want to keep... So that's why they say religion stinks and put it up on a billboard. That's why they tell you, oh, I hate religion. I, I saw a billboard like that. We hate religion. No, yeah, you hate keeping yourself unspotted from the world because you want to pattern your music after ACDC and you want to pattern your music after all the rock and roll and hip hop. Of course you don't want to keep yourself unspotted from the world. You want to have women up there singing on the platform in mini skirts when the Bible says that if you don't have your thighs covered, that you're exposing your nakedness according to Exodus 28, 42. But you're not going to hear that preached in these churches because it's going to turn people away and we're going to reach more people if we never talk about the fact that exposing your thighs is nakedness. We're going to reach more people if we don't talk about that. And we're going to reach more people if we don't preach on all the do's and don'ts. Let me tell you something. The Bible is filled with do's and don'ts from Genesis to Revelation. And Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He didn't say, if you love me, keep my suggestions. He didn't say, uh, 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 if you love me, uh, uh, just have a good relationship with me. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And all the way through, whether you're in the epistles of Paul, whether you're in the epistles of John, all the way to Revelation, God is emphasizing that he is the boss. Amen. You know what he says over and over again? I am the Lord. I am the Lord. I, am the Lord. I think 61 times he said, I am the Lord, somewhere around that number. And what does Lord mean? The boss. I'm the boss. I'm the boss. Obey my commandments. Obey my commandments. Do as I say. Uh, listen to what I'm saying. Follow the rules. And yet this movement today downplays that and says, hey, it's not about the do's and the don'ts. It's just about your heart. No, the Bible says that we should obey the commandments from our heart. Well, just as long as you love God. Yeah, but the Bible says this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Go to John chapter 6. John chapter number 6. I got to hurry because there are so many things philosophically and biblically wrong with this movement. I got to hurry just to get to them all. Because we already saw their hatred and disdain for the word religion and their disgust for all the do's and don'ts, which the Bible defines as religion. Uh, we've already seen the fact that they're gearing a church service toward the unsaved instead of the saved. We've already seen how they downplay doctrine. And because they downplay doctrine, you know what the result of that is? Different people in the church will believe completely different things. And like I said, I've been there for five years. You show up at a small group Bible study, everybody believes something different because there's no doctrine being taught. So you talk to one person and they'll tell you, I mean, I sat at a Bible study and one person said, oh, if you're saved, you die, you go straight to heaven. Another person said, oh, if you're saved, you die, you, you lay in the ground and you wait to be resurrected hundreds of years or thousands of years later. And you're just asleep in the, in the earth, your soul sleep. And then a third person said, well, here's what I believe. I believe that when you die, it's just like you're automatically time warped to the, the final judgment and you're just there. So I mean, we had three very distinctly different views, but it was like that with every subject. Everybody's got a different version of the Bible. You go around and read in a circle, you got the King James, you got the NIV, you got the New King James, you got the New American Standard, and, and everybody believes something different. One person says, oh, we don't do tongue speaking. Another person says, oh, that's my prayer language. You know, another person says, oh, I believe it's all right as long as there's an interpreter. And it's all in the same church. I mean, the doctrines are just all over the place. I mean, everybody believes something. Some people believe that salvation is eternal. Other people believe you can lose it. 
Why? Because the doctrine's not being preached from the pulpit, so people don't know what the truth is. They don't know what to believe. But not only that, this new megachurch movement seeks to maximize attendance at all costs. I mean, their goal is, let's bring in as many people as we can. Let's reach as many people as we can. And again, nothing wrong with being big, but when you're doing it at all costs, that's where it becomes a... Let's see if that was Jesus' attitude. Go to John chapter 6, verse 66. Okay, this is uh, where we can see Jesus' opinion on this subject. It says in John 6, 66, From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with them. So Jesus just preached a sermon. He lost a lot of people. Look what it says in verse 67. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Oh no, what did I say? What did I do wrong? L look what Jesus said. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? And will there in the Bible means do you want to? Basically, in our modern vernacular, what he said is, So, do you guys want to leave too? Don't let the door hit you on your way out. That's basically what he's saying there. So, do you want to leave too? He didn't say, oh, I better change my message. I better rethink this. He preached the truth. And because the truth offended people and made people leave, he looked at the 12 and said, so, you want to leave too? Go right ahead. The door swings both ways. This is Jesus' attitude toward the attendance. It says in verse 68, Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Looks like the right people stayed behind. You know, and the people who left, they obviously, you know, left for a reason. Go to uh, Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter number 15. And this goes hand in hand with the point about seeking to maximize attendance at all costs. This movement also seeks not to offend people at all costs. Because, yeah. you know, you're not going to maximize attendance by offending people. Because when you offend people, they don't come back. Okay? So if you're going to maximize attendance at all costs, number one, you've got to pattern it after the world. You've got to bring in the rock music. You've got to bring in the hip-hop. That's what they want to hear. You've got to make the message 20 minutes instead of 60 minutes or 70 minutes. You've got to bring that down to a 15, 20-minute little sermonette because that's what they want, something quick. They can just get it over with and get out to the lake and strip down half-naked and get on their boat in their bikini you know, and spend their Sunday like that after they get their 20-minute sermon on the love of Jesus compelling him to die on the cross, okay, for the 150th time. Now look at Matthew 15, verse 12. It says, Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? So Jesus just preached a sermon where he just railed on the Pharisees. And, and the disciples came up to him and said, Look, Jesus, don't you know that what you've said has offended the Pharisees? I mean, do you not realize that you offended them? And look what he said. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Go to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter number 11. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Now in Luke chapter 11, Jesus preaches another just scathing sermon against the Pharisees. In fact, every verse he starts out saying, Woe unto you Pharisees! And then he says everything that they're doing wrong. And in Matthew 23, the Bible gives us an even longer version of this sermon. In Matthew chapter 23, every verse he's calling them hypocrites, he's railing on them, and he's, uh, he's just preaching directly at the Pharisees, naming them off. Look what it says in Luke eleven forty three. Woe unto you, Pharisees, for you love the uppermost seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for, for ye are as graves which appear not, and the men that walk over them are not aware of them. Now look what he says in verse 45. Then answered one of the lawyers and said unto him, Master, thus saying thou reproachest us also. And here's what they're saying. They're saying, you know, the way you're preaching against the Pharisees, it almost sounds like some of this might be directed at us. You know, by saying that, you're attacking us now. Because the lawyers were a different group than the Pharisees. So he's preaching real hard against the Pharisees, and the lawyers are like, hey, wait a minute. This kind of sounds like stuff that we're guilty of, you know? Are you, are you trying to get on us now? And he said, no, guys, no, no, I'm just, it's just the Pharisees that are, the, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. Now look what it says in verse 46. And he said, woe unto you also, you lawyers. <laughs> and then what's funny is that he just keeps preaching and now he just switches. Now it's just not woe unto the Pharisees anymore. It just keeps being woe unto you lawyers. He just gets specifically on the, they come and complain to him about his preaching 
And he says, okay, well, I guess I touched a nerve. Time to, I think I'm just going to park it there then and just park it on you lawyers then since apparently uh, you need to hear this more than anybody. He says, woe unto you also, you lawyers, for you laid men with burdens grievous to be born, and ye yourselves touch not the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe unto you. And he jumps down to verse uh, 52. He says, woe unto you, lawyers, for you've taken away the key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in ye hindered. And as he said these things unto them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to urge him vehemently and to provoke him to speak many things, laying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. And so this movement seeks not to offend, but the Bible says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. You see, the people that are offended by the preaching are usually the people who needed to hear it the most. No matter what the subject because if they're offended, that usually means that they're guilty of whatever the sin that's being preached upon. And so if we love God and love his word, we'll not be offended. When we hear the preaching, we will know it's, it's true and we will know that we should uh, adjust our lives as, uh, accordingly. But look if you would at Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter number one, let me know, show you another problem with, it, with this movement of uh, contemporary or modernistic type churches. <laughs> is that they seek to please man. They don't seek to please God. And the Bible says in Galatians 1.10, this is a great verse. It says, For do I now persuade man or God? Or do I seek to please men? Watch this. For if I yet pleased men, saying if I still pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. So according to the Bible, a person who desires to please man is the wrong type of person to serve Christ. Isn't that what the Bible says? He says, if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Therefore, the servant of Christ should not seek to please men. He should only seek to please God, and he should only seek to persuade God. I want to persuade God that I'm doing right, not persuade everyone around me that I'm doing right. And the Bible says in Ephesians 6.6, 6, you don't have to turn there, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. The Bible says if we're doing the will of God from the heart, we're not doing it so that people will look at us and be pleased with us. We're just doing it because it's the right thing to do. And we do it right, and it comes from the heart, and that's it. Now, uh, Matthew chapter 23, if you would. Matthew 23, this is that scathing sermon that Jesus preached against the Pharisees. And let me show you another problem with this movement. And look, this mo can you see this movement is very unbiblical and unscriptural in their approach? They, they, they're gearing it toward the unsaved instead of the saved. And, and by the way, they don't knock doors and go soul winning. When was the last time one of these liberal mega churches came and knocked on your door? What do they do instead? What do they do? Help me out. They mail stuff to you. Isn't that right? They mail, well, you know what? So does Burger King. They mail me stuff too. Does that, do they love me? You know what, the, what? What does Burger King love about me when they send me coupons in the mail? What do they love about me? They love my money. Hmm, that reminds me of somebody else who mails me stuff all the time. Who mails me advertisements all the time. And they don't care what I am. They don't care if I'm Hindu, Buddhist. That's why they're non-denominational. Because they don't care if I'm a Baptist, a Methodist, an Episcopalian, a Catholic. They don't, as long as my money's green, that's all they care about. That's why they say, everybody, come on in, everybody come in. Methodist, and we're not going to try to change you. We're not, if you've been sprinkled, we're not going to try to baptize you. We're not going to try to, we're not going to judge you. We're not going to tell you what's wrong. We're not going to tell you what the doctrine is. Just come on in and worship with them. We want everybody to worship here. And, you know, it's all about getting the money. That's what it's about. Yeah. They are teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. And it's about making money and getting lots and lots of money coming in. You know, it, it's funny. Uh, my brother was telling me about a ministry that he had... Uh, come into contact with. It was some kind of a, it, it was kind of like Brother Garrett preached a sermon in the preaching class a month or two ago about the, the homeless ministries. And, you know, it was, it was that type of a ministry. And, you know, they were really yoked up with a lot of false religion, this particular ministry. And they were really taking money from a lot of sources that were not godly sources. And here's what the guy said. He said, you know what, Clint, or, or whoever he was talking to, he said, you know what? He said, the only tainted money is the money that taint there. 
He said, that's the only tainted money. You know, the money that taint there. And, and you know, that's the attitude of these churches. Just bring the money. We don't care what do not. We don't care. Oh, you're living with another man. You're a man living with another man in sodomy? Come on in. The water's fine. Here, let's pass the plate a second time. That is the society that we're living in today. And that is why we go out so many and knock doors. And there are so many people who go to church every week. And you ask them, do you know for sure if you died today, you go to heaven? And they say, I don't know. I hope so. I'm a pretty good person. Because there's no doctrine. That's why. Because there's no, there's no love of God, that's why. Because there's no prayer and Bible reading and soul winning. It's just a big money-making entertainment fest is what it is. And it's wicked. And that's why, you know, I'm not going to try to make church invitations that look like theirs. And try to make a website that look like theirs. And try to design our music to be like theirs. And try to start, you know, I'm not going to start calling myself the lead pastor. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to start, you know, put on a Hawaiian shirt so I can look like Rick Warren or something. You know, and, and this is the movement that I want to get as far away from as I possibly can. Because it's a movement that is about pleasing man and not pleasing God. But looked at, did I have you turn to Matthew 23? Yes. The, uh, lastly, this, the problem with this movement is that it is a movement that neglects all things external. They only care about what's on the inside. And you say, well, Pastor Anderson, that sounds great. You know, I mean, that's... I mean, isn't that how we should all be? Just, just only caring about what's inside and forgetting the external. Well, you know what? No, that's not how we should be. Now, a lot of times there's a little bit of truth in every lie. And when they say, you know, it's the inside that counts, look, of course the inside is the most important. Wouldn't everybody probably agree with that? What's inside is the most important. What's more important, the outside or the inside? The inside's more important, right? What's more important, our heart or how we look on the outside? Our heart's more important. But wait a minute, does that mean that the outside is just totally unimportant? Just because we say that one thing is more important, right? That doesn't mean that the other is unimportant. Okay. For example, I could say that, you know, my family is more important to me than my bank account, right? I mean, my family and spending time with my family and having a good relationship with my wife and children is more important to me than how much money I have. Isn't that a good statement to make? Okay, but what if I just said, my money and my finances mean nothing? <laughs> well, then pretty soon my family's going to die of starvation. So it's foolish to say, well, you know, just because one thing is more important, I'm going to spend all my time on that. Spend all my energy on that. Well, the gospel is the most important thing. So let's eat a banana and a glass of raw milk every day until we die. No, you, you, just because one thing's more important doesn't mean that the other's not important. Now look what Jesus said about the outside and the inside in verse 25 of Matthew 23. It says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Now these people are hypocrites. They have the outside right, but the inside's completely wrong, isn't it? But look at the next verse. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, because the outside doesn't matter. Is that what it says? No. It says, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. So what is the destination here? The destination is getting to the point where the inside and the outside are clean. The destination is not a clean inside and a dirty outside. No. He never says the outside doesn't matter. And let me ask you this. If Jesus really thought that the outside didn't matter, why did he write a whole chapter about the length of your hair? 1 Corinthians 11. Explain that to me. If the outside doesn't matter. And then, and then somebody sent me a message criticizing that sermon saying, why would you waste your time preaching a whole sermon about the length of somebody's hair when there are all these other more important things that you should be preaching about. You need to preach that you need to get back to preaching the meat of the word. Okay, my question is why did God spend a whole chapter talking about it? If I wasted a whole sermon on it, why did he waste a whole chapter on it? You know why? Because it matters. Because it's important. And you know what? There is a lot of scripture in the Bible about the outside. And if you're going to say the outside doesn't matter, what you're saying is that huge portions of scripture don't matter. You're going to throw away half of 1 Corinthians 11. You're going to throw away all, all the 
teachings in the, in the New Testament and the Old Testament about modest apparel. I mean, look how many times Paul talks to women about the way that they dress and the way that they look. About how they should have modest apparel, shouldn't wear the gold and, and precious stones and pearls and, and costly array. And he goes into their hair and he goes in their clothing and he talks to men about the same thing. And then when he lays out the priesthood in the Old Testament, he's telling the priests how to dress. He's telling the priests how to cut their hair. Why if it didn't matter? Because it does matter. That's why. And because there's not one verse in the Bible that says, like for example, the Bible says man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh on the heart. You know, a lot of people have interpreted that to where God doesn't look on the outward appearance at all. No, God looks on the outward and the inward. He sees both. Which one's more important? The inside. But they're both important. And if we get the inside right, the Bible says that the result of that will be that the outside will get right also. Now think about this. According to this scripture, does getting the outside right, does getting the outside right automatically make the inside right? No, it doesn't, does it? But does getting the inside right have a result of making the outside right also? Yes, it does. So if somebody has a completely wrong outside, doesn't that tell you there's something wrong on the inside? Because if they got the inside clean, then the outside of them would be clean also. Okay, and so this uh, movement of modern contemporary style churches just completely neglects everything about the outside. Just completely neglect. I mean, uh, my dad visited a church of a relative of ours and, and literally the guy who took the offering was wearing a Hooters t-shirt. But don't judge. Who, who laughed? That was, you're judging. Who was that? You're busted. Oh, oh. Don't judge. Look, you're coming to church in a Hooters t-shirt. You know what you're saying? I have zero respect for church. I have zero respect for God's house. The Bible says that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And you're walking in with a Metallica shirt. You're walking in with a Hooters t-shirt. You're walking in in your pajamas, like, like these people who go to Walmart at 1130 at night or something. That's how you're showing up to church. And then you think that that's okay. You know what it shows? Utter disdain, utter disrespect, and a total lack of caring is what it shows. That's what it shows. You say, well, preach the Bible. Okay, well, the Bible preaches that men are supposed to have short hair. 1 Corinthians 11, whole chapter about it. The Bible preaches that men are supposed to wear men's clothing. Women are supposed to wear women's clothing. The Bible teaches that exposing your thighs is nakedness. The Bible teaches that it is a sin to have tattoos. The Bible says in Leviticus 19.28, you shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, listen to me, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. So the Bible clearly states that we should not print marks on our body. But yet, you will never hear that preached in one of these churches because they'll teach the outside doesn't matter. Now you say, were you mad at people who have tattoos? Absolutely not, because here's the thing about tattoos, they don't come off. Now I used to think that you could get them removed until I spoke, because you know, you see signs. I even saw a billboard this week that said, you know, tattoo removal. But you know what? Until I talked to somebody who tried getting them removed, and then I went online and did some research about getting them removed, folks, they don't come off. I mean, getting them removed is a horrific process that's very expensive and that, that, that scars you. I mean, there's just a lot. It, it does, it's not just as simple as, oh, it's like it never was on there. I mean, you can, if you really have to get rid of it, it's possible. But it's, it's very, very difficult and it's never going to be fully gone. And so you ought to think about that, oh, thou 17-year-old who's about to turn 18 and, and go out and get that, that tattoo. You know, that that thing's permanent. You might not want that when you're 55 years old, the one that you got when you're 18. And look, I'm not mad at you if you have tattoos, because you know what? Everybody's made mistakes. I, I, you know, some people's mistakes are just more visible than others, but we've all made mistakes. We all have things in our past that we've done that were stupid things, things that we're ashamed of. But look, does that mean I'm not going to preach what the Bible teaches, though? Oh, somebody's done that? Oh, somebody has a tattoo. I better just not preach that part of the Bible then. Better just not preach it. No, of course I'm going to preach it. Look, I'm not trying to beat people up who've already made a mistake a long time ago. And, and you know what? The people, the people who've done it, they, they're probably amening everything I'm saying right now because they're thinking, yeah, he's telling the truth. I regret getting it. And I don't want other people to get it. So, you know, they should listen to this preaching. And if not, then their heart's not right. 
If they're going to sit there and begrudge the preaching of God's word because, oh, I did that. Well, you know, there are a lot of dumb things that I've done too, but I want to hear it preached about. Because I don't want other people to make the same dumb mistakes that I've made. And, and, you know, we've all made mistakes. No one is perfect. But you know what? That doesn't mean that we should just neglect to preach the truth because we're afraid of offending people. Because we want to maximize our attendance. Because we want to gear it toward the unsaved. Because we want to neglect everything external and only talk about the internal. But you know, the external does have an effect and it does matter. You know, as you study the Old Testament, a lot of the things in the Old Testament no longer apply to us today. Things that were specifically, and listen to me now, only things that were specifically changed do not apply to us. Anything that has not been specifically changed, Jesus said, I'm establishing the law. I'm not breaking down the law or the prophets. We need to still believe it. Moses is read every week, he said, and, and we need to follow it. But there are a lot of things that specifically change from Old to New Testament. Like, for example, we don't offer sacrifices. That would specifically change. We don't observe the Sabbath specifically tells us not to worry about keeping the Sabbath in the New Testament. Uh, you know, uh, what else has changed? Uh, the meats, the drinks, the divers' washings, the carnal ordinances. Back then, you could only eat certain types of meat during that time. Now we can eat all things. And they're all different uh, things where he specifically says that they've changed. Now, one of those major things that has changed is the Levitical priesthood. You know, we don't have a Levitical priesthood and a tabernacle and all that. But does that mean that we still can't learn something from studying the Levitical priesthood? Of course not, because the Bible teaches that all Scripture is profitable for doctrine. And you know, when I look at the Levitical priesthood, I notice that there's a whole lot of discussion about what they wear, okay, and how they dress. And then there's one specific thing that he brings up, and he says that they're not supposed to wear any material that causeth sweat. Does anybody ever remember reading that Scripture? You know, it talks about them not wearing a material that causes sweat. And he talks about how their garments have to be clean and all this stuff. Now, obviously, we're not going in and serving the tabernacle and performing a sacrifice or, or lighting up incense. But can't we learn from that principle that when God was setting up people as leadership and when God is setting up people to preach the word of God and to teach the people and to be their leaders, that he wanted them to at least take care of themselves in some degree because he's telling them to bathe their flesh in water and not to wear anything that causeth sweat, okay, when they go in to minister. Why? What is wrong with sweating? The Bible said that when you, the Bible said that when you go to work, that you work by the sweat of your face and God commands us to go out and work and sweat, doesn't he? So why is he telling the priest that when he ministers not to wear anything that causes sweat? What is the detriment of sweat? It stinks. It smells bad, right? So why does he not want the priest to smell bad? Why does he not want the priest? Because look, when we go out, when we go out to work, like for example, you know, I was doing a little project around the house yesterday. I had to fix some, some broken down things in my house. And so I was working and I, I became very sweaty. And not only that, but I was working with plumbing. And you know, when you work with plumbing, you get into a lot of really gross things, right? Just, just because, the, you know, the stuff sits in the pipes, and you know how pipes get gunked up, and stuff just get, you know, so I'm digging stuff out of pipes, I'm digging sludge out of pipes, and so I was covered in sweat, I'm also covered in sludge, you know, and then I walked up to give my wife a hug, okay? And, you know, my wife wanted to give me a hug, and then as I got closer, she's like, what in the world, you know, what does that smell? Look, there's nothing in the world wrong with going out and smelling bad and working hard and getting all sweaty and stinky, being a plumber or being an electrician or being whatever. But you know what? Why did God not want them to wear something that makes them stink when they're going in to minister? Because they want basically the people to have respect for them. They don't want to, because people don't respect somebody who's a slob. That's why. Are you listening? You know, if they show up and they stink and their clothes are dirty and they're not dressed nice, then basically people are going to look at them and they're going to have disdain or a lack of respect for them because they are not uh, taking care of themselves. You know, when we, when we uh, have leaders in this world, we, don't we expect them to take care of themselves to a certain degree? I mean, like, for example, the President of the United States. You know, what if, he sh what if he went on TV and did a press conference and he's wearing a dirty shirt? He's got a big stain on his shirt. <laughs> or he's just wearing, you know, t-shirt and sweatpants. 
and he's, you know, he's given a State of the Union. You know, you, you don't, what do you expect him to wear? You know, you expect him to dress nice. You expect him to wear a, a shirt, tie, a jacket, just because of the fact that he's in a formal setting. Now, if you were to come across him in an informal setting, you wouldn't expect that necessarily, but wouldn't you still expect his clothes to be clean? You know, maybe a tucked in polo shirt or something, just, just something classy, something clean, something nice, not just to look totally slovenly and sluggardly. Uh, look, what about the general in the army? Would you expect the general to be uh, just casual out, slovenly, slug? No, you wouldn't expect that at all, would you? What about the boss at work? What about the owner of the company? Is that how he dresses? You know, usually when you're in a, in a, in a store, you can tell who the manager is, right? Why? Because they're dressed a little bit nicer than everybody else. And by the way, if you work at your job and you want to become the manager, start dressing nicer, they'll make you the manager. Because they'll look at you and think, this guy looks like a manager. <laughs> Seriously. It's true. You say, well, that's not in the Bible. No, but if you're smart, you'll, you'll, you'll take the advice. Because, and by the way, even in your home, I even, I even have made a point in my home to dress nice even when I'm at home. Because I want my wife and children to respect me. And you know, they don't always see me when I'm out slogging and working hard and working my fingers to the bone somewhere. And they don't always necessarily see me uh, working hard and making all the money that I, you know, that I make to provide. But when I'm at home, sometimes my tendency when I get home is because it's my day off, right? Because I've been working hard and struggling. My tendency when I'm at home is to just basically lounge around in like a t-shirt and shorts or something. You know what I mean? Because you're just, you're just glad to be home. You're taking it easy and lounging. But you know what? I found it helpful to just every day get dressed and dress nice and put my shoes on every day and just look like I mean business and look more serious. That has even caused me to get more respect in my own home. Why? Because, you know, you don't want to be a slob anywhere. You don't want to be slobbing anywhere. And I'm not against athletic clothing if you're performing athletics, okay? But when you're just wearing a sweatsuit every day of your life, you're not gonna get the same respect. And you know what the thing is? This movement teaches that the pastor should come to church as casual as he possibly can. That's what they teach. And I'm not saying that everybody has to wear a shirt and tie or a suit. That's what I wear because this is, this is what I consider nice clothing. And, you know, if I were in the Philippines or China or somewhere else, you know, nice clothing would probably consist of something different. Or if I were in Africa or something, nice clothing might look different than what it looks like, you know, in the United States of America. But, you know, this movement that tells the pastor to come to church in flip-flops, you know, wrinkled up cargo shorts, a graphic t-shirt that's faded, hair punked out. He's trying to look like a teenager. I'm not trying to look like a teenager. You know why? Because I don't want to be treated like a teenager. You know, I, I, we know a pastor here in town, and every time I see this guy, he looks like a rock star. He looks like a teenager. He dresses and looks like he's 15 years old. Well, you know what? If you want to go to a church where the pastor dresses like he's 15, people are going to start treating him like he's 15. Yeah. And people aren't going to have any respect for him. They're not going to respect what he's saying because if he looks like a joke, they're going to start treating him like a joke. And so this carries across to every area of life, my friend. You know, be serious about the way that you look because yes, the outside does matter. Is the inside more important? It's 10 times more important. But don't fall into this trap of completely neglecting your appearance. And you look, wives, husbands, whatever. You know, you just say, oh, well, I'm married to my wife. She's going to live with me for the rest of her life anyway. I'm just going to just let myself go. I'm going to take a shower every week whether I need it or not. You know, I'm not going to dress nice. I'm not going to put on deodorant. I'm not going to brush my teeth. Who gives a rip? It's the inside that counts. She better love me for who I am. I mean, wouldn't that be ridiculous? Yeah. And you know, this mentality that says, you know what, let's go to church, let's come in our pajamas, let's come in our flip-flops, the pastor's going to get up and he's wearing a, 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 a dirty pair of jeans, he's wearing trendy clothes that make him look like a teenager, and then you wonder why people aren't taking the Word of God seriously. Because the pastor is dressing like a teenager. Amen. And I'm not a teenager today. One there was a time when I was a teenager. 
Okay? And if you would have known me when I was a teenager, I thought as a teenager, I spake as a teenager, I understood as a teenager, and when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. And this childish movement today, where the pastor, who is also known as the elder, the elder of the church is standing up, dressed like a rebellious teenager, rocking out like a teenager. It just shows a total lack of maturity, a total lack of seriousness, and a total disdain for anything about keeping their external right. We don't care what you look like. We don't care what the pastor looks like. It's just all about how cool and trendy we can be. And we could drive around and go to all these churches and the pastor will look the same in all of them in 2013. But five years ago, he would have looked completely different. And five years ago, he would have looked completely different than that because it's just whatever the trend is amongst teenagers. What kind of a backward society do we live in where we go down to the high school and look at how the teenagers are dressed and that's how I'm going to pattern my clothing? No, we ought to tell them how to dress. Pull up your pants. Quit wearing these tight little queer jeans that make you look like, you know, this bird-legged little emo queer little sissy. Get a pair of pants that fits right. Pull it up. Button your pants. Buckle the belt. Tuck in your shirt. Wear clean clothes. Comb your hair. And quit looking like a slob. But you know what? If the pastor looks like a slob, well, we're probably all going to look like a slob. And look, I'm not, I don't primp and preen myself all day, but you know what? I'm not going to look like a slob either. And I'm not going to dress like a teenager either. And so you say, well, Pastor Anderson, I disagree with everything you preach. Well, then you know what? You're not going to have any problem finding a church. If you disagree with my sermon this morning, you're going to have a really easy time finding another church. Just go to the yellow page and just find the biggest ad. Better yet, go to your mailbox. It's right between the Burger King ad and the McDonald's ad, okay? You'll find that invitation to that liberal mega church. You know, go ahead, just, just drive down the freeway, you'll see the billboards, and you can go rock out, and you can hear the plan of salvation one more time, but it's not going to have any doctrine. It's not going to tell you how to be saved biblically. It'll just talk about Jesus dying on the cross, because, you know, we can't offend the people who believe it's by works or that you can lose it, or that you have to repent of your sins, or that you don't, or that you have to be baptized, or that you don't, or that it's faith alone, or faith plus works. But you know what? You can go, you can rock out, you don't even, you can roll out of bed in your pajamas, you can show up, you can jam for Jesus, you can juke and jive and gyrate, and then you can get your 15 minute uh, sermon on the love of Christ, and you know what? Starbucks is in the lobby, and it's a discounted price. It's perfect. Or you can come to a real church where we actually read scores of scriptures and learn biblical doctrines and actually care about every aspect of serving God, not just salvation, but also living the life, getting the inside right, and then getting the outside right as a result. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word, and we thank you so much that you set us an example by not worrying about offending people, not, not really caring what the attendance was, you just said, well, you want to go away also? Help us to not get sucked into this modern church movement. Help Faithful Word Baptist Church to never go down that route. And help us to stay old-fashioned and stay traditional and stay conservative and not become this uh, liberal, modernistic, contemporary type of a church. And in Jesus' name.